There's a sign that I'm, that I'm supposed to start. Hi, welcome uh, to PHP Unit for Drupal developers. I am Sebastian, and I've been doing things with PHP on to PHP for a really long time now. And when I say a really long time, that, it, that means it's a little bit over 19 years now that I had my first contact with PHP. Uh, I grew up, at least, when it comes to computing and programming uh, in the Amiga demo scene. I learned programming in C and assembly machine language on, on the Amiga back in the 80s and 90s. And at some point, uh, someone who I knew from, from that community at some point contacted me and said, hey, back then you did the 2D and 3D real-time graphics routines in assembly on the Amiga. That's basically the same thing as programming websites. So, that, so that, that was our graphics artist from the team that I was involved in. And he was now doing websites, and he said, well, I need something um, that is not just HTML, but something dynamic on the website. Um, was a, it was a very complicated uh, guest book that he wanted, basically. Uh, but for you, that's, that's exactly the same as what you did back then. I said, I have never done anything with web development. Uh, what are the programming languages? And he said, well, you have the choice between PHP and Perl. And I looked at Perl for like an hour or so and then decided, no, I don't want to learn that. Uh, and I went with PHP and within a week and I learned enough PHP to implement what uh, my friend wanted. And then um, a couple of months later, I started to use PHP uh, for real. And at some point, um, while I was still in university, I came across uh, the concepts of testing and quality assurance and unit tests and JUnit. And I wanted to have something like that for PHP. It didn't exist. And without really thinking about it, I started to work on PHP unit. And that was some time around summer, fall of 2000. And in 2001, I published the first version of PHP unit. And now I'm here. What am I doing when I'm not speaking at conferences and not working um, on open source projects? Uh, I'm an IT consultant um, with the PHP consulting company. I help PHP teams like this team over there um, to build better software using PHP. And that involves a lot of things around PHP units, writing uh, effective tests, coming up with e efficient testing strategies, and teaching them how to write testable code, because without testable code, it's not fun. Uh, that's my company, but I'm not going into any marketing. Uh, some of the companies that I've had the pleasure of working with, some really small, some really large, Pro most of them you probably never have heard of, some of them you have heard of, I guess, but no marketing. Um, the only thing that I would like to say before I start um, with the presentation is I would like to thank everyone who made it possible for me to be here. There was a crowdfunding um, to cover my travel expenses to get here. And if you want to find out why I need my travel expenses covered, then I invite you to read this article that I wrote on, on my blog. Um, and that's it. Thank you for, uh, uh, to everyone who made it possible for me to be here. So, websites, testing, what is this all about? Um, I have this horrible recollection of the first time that I set foot into an agency, an internet web development agency somewhere around 1999. Um, no, that, that's, not, that's not right. Uh, summer 2000. For summer of 2000, I had vacation from university. Um, the world's first PHP conference, which happened in October 2000 in Cologne, had just had published um, their schedule, and I was on the schedule, and a company from Cologne called me. I still have no clue how they got my phone number, um, but they called me um, on a Friday and said, hey, we, we, we learned from the agenda of this conference that you know something about PHP. We need a PHP developer, uh, and we know that you are at university, and university is currently off, so you are free, uh, and can you start Monday? This sounded so ridiculous that I said, sure, yes, and on Monday I, I went there and worked there for a couple of days and then, then I left. 
Um, but what I found, found really interesting was they really started with paper and big plans, planning for six months, and then after six months they started doing things in Photoshop, and at some point maybe Photoshop or maybe it was something else, Dreamweaver or something, front page, I mean, 90s, long ago, I'm getting old. Software that we don't want to talk about, so today we probably would use something like Photoshop. Um, generate HTML from that, and then you look at that for the first time in your browser, and then you need to tweak it a bit, and what do you do when you work on HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and you look at it in your website, and you are tweaking things? You hit F5 a lot. That's the, the, the fr at least the front-end developer's main feedback loop. I changed something, I hit F5, and it's really interesting in, in, in hindsight how old this F5 hitting for reload uh, is. Um, I, re I actually checked recently. Um, this, by the way, is my second computer, but the one that I still have, it's an Amiga 1200, it still works. I no longer use dial-up modem to connect to the internet. Now it's on Wi-Fi, and that works. Um, and back then, the really early versions of, uh, of Web, of graphical browsers, even for the Amiga, you hit F5 to reload, and that's how I started um, with HTML and CSS. Well, I'm not sure if it was CSS at the time, maybe, maybe just plain HTML um, on the Amiga way back when. So you hit F5 and you made a change to see whether or not the change uh, had the desired effect. That's our feedback loop. Okay. That may be, that kind of feedback loop may be fine if you're just looking at visual things. When you're looking at, okay, I changed this CSS rule, I changed this tag from an H1 to an H2, does it look right? Maybe then this kind of feedback loop um, is okay and sufficient. But what if we change something in our PHP code, something that actually has maybe side effects, maybe we have uh, an e-commerce application and when I click something, I don't only, I, I not only want to see a new page, the next page in the process, but I actually want to make sure that I actually talked to the payment service correctly and got my money so that I can send a note to the warehouse and uh, ship something. So what does our feedback loop look like uh, for PHP code? And of course, so at least in the early days since Many PHP developers came from front end, they used the same feedback loop, they just made a change in PHP code, hit F5, and looked what happened. Um, but in most cases, for, for, for application logic, for domain logic, you need to look deeper. So we need to actually open up our, not the computer, that's just for, for visualization, but we need to look deeper, we need to look what happens uh, inside the PHP code on the back end and not just on the front end. And maybe we go to the command line, use the PHP build and web server, run, in this case, our application, which is Drupal, send a request, and then use var dump, print r, whatever we are used to, to put into our PHP code to do on the fly testing or debugging um, the old school way. That maybe qualifies as a feedback loop, but for me, I, like around 1999, 2000, um, when I was exposed to JUnit at university with Java, which I never really used in production, but I like the concept and, and the idea of writing something that automatically verifies uh, that my code works correctly. That feedback loop started to feel uh, wrong to me, and that's not really uh, the feedback loop you, you should be looking for, right? That's the main board of my Amiga with some Lego. That's not the feedback loop you're looking for. You don't want to do print R and var dump based testing in your production code. Historically speaking, though, that's how in the really, really, really early days testing started you put additional debugging statements into your production code, ran the code, and checked whether or not 
at a certain point in time during the execution of your program, the program was in the state that you expected it to be in. There are programming languages where that is still a best practice, a good practice uh, today. So C, C++, and other languages have built-in constructs, um, the assert statement that, is, that checks at runtime whether or not the software is in a given state. I mean, it's not in that state execution is aborted. That works, and it can be used to put some safeguards into, uh, into place that you do not run into really bad situations, into, uh, into um, situations that you don't want to be in, illegal states of the system, if you will. But it's not really testing. It's just a safeguard. And yes, that can be abused for some testing or some debugging on while, while, while you're testing, but the tests do not belong into the production code the code that actually runs in production. And that's a realization um, that I don't know who first came up with it. The earliest framework that I know that had this idea was SUnit for Smalltalk by Kent Beck, um, which according to legend almost nobody used. Um, and then they had this famous um, flight from, from Zurich uh, to Atlanta where Kent Beck was sitting next to Erich Gamma and Erich Gamma on his laptop had Java with him, like one of the first versions of Java. And he had heard about SUnit and he wanted to have SUnit for Java. And Kent Beck had heard about Java but had not used Java yet so they ported while flying from Zurich to Atlanta SUnit uh, to Java and out came JUnit. And their idea was, okay, let's take these debugging statements like what we in PHP would use, print or print R or var dump, they just used a, a, a print or a printf. Um, take these statements, pull them out of the production code, put them into separate source code files that we can run when we want to test something and we don't need to put that, those files into production, don't need to compile them into the production binary, don't deploy them, have them separate so that we have a separation of production code and test code and that's what all these um, test frameworks that are in the tradition of the XUnit family of test frameworks, SUnit, JUnit, CPP unit was the third one, PHP unit was um, it came shortly after CPP unit. Um, so, so that can give us a different feedback loop. Right? We want to automate our tests. Another downside, uh, in addition to having test code and production code mixed, and mixing things is never a good idea, at least not in, in software development. Another downside is that you cannot really automatically evaluate it. Uh, you always need a human to look at the var dump output and figure out whether or not that makes sense, whether that's the correct state. Yes, of course, you can put additional logic in there and make a check and print something nice when it works correctly or only print something when it's wrong, but that's still doesn't belong into the production code. That's, so we put it out, we, we, we pull it out, write it somewhere else, and automate it and make it really easy to run these tests and get useful information out of running these tests. Things like how many tests did I execute? Were they successful? Which tests failed? What is the reason why these tests have failed? Where in the code um, was the application running or currently executing when something failed? which parts of my application are actually covered by tests and where uh, do I have blind spots, where am I missing tests? So that leads us to automated tests. And automated tests is a piece of code that you write down that can be automatically executed by a, uh, a testing tool. And PHP unit is two things. It's on the one hand a framework for writing tests, for making it as easy and simple and convenient as possible to write down your test intent 
to capture how you want to invoke the unit of code that you're, that you're testing and what you expect to happen, what you expect for the test to be successful, what the success criteria is. And the other thing that PHP unit is, is a command line based tool that executes these tests and reports useful information based on the test execution. When we talk about software tests, there are many different types or categories of software tests. One category I already mentioned, automated tests. The opposite of automated tests is of course manual testing using a real human with a real mouse and a real keyboard in front of a real computer with a real browser exercising the application. Uh, and these kinds of tests are really useful when you want to do usability tests, for instance. Is the user interface or is the user experience, does it work? Um, do your users actually understand it and can use your application uh, conveniently? That's automated versus manual. Another categorization uh, that now comes into play is dynamic versus static. Tests that you implement using PHP unit are so-called dynamic tests because they test the software while executing the software, while the software is running. That's what you need to do for testing using PHP unit, for testing uh, things like performance and scalability um, with tools like JMeter and Siege and others. There's a, a complete separate category of tests from that that is called static testing or static analysis. Testing the software without actually executing it. That's what PHP code sniffer for instance does. It looks at your code and checks whether or not it conforms to your coding guidelines. Or things like PHP copy paste detector that look at your code and tell you where you have duplicated pieces of code that you should consolidate into only one uh, occurrence of the code. Or things like uh, PHP stan or fan that actually try to comprehend the code and tell you, okay, you have something, you have an area here that is hard to understand that's in the long run um, prone to errors and hard to understand for new developers that have to work with it, refactor this, make it simpler so that it's easier to read and easier to understand the code or to find um, bugs and other problems. We are talking about automated dynamic tests. And one of the most common and popular um, ways of implementing these automated dynamic tests is in the form of unit tests, Exer <coughs> tests that exercise one unit of code in isolation from all of their dependencies. These tests are really precise. When they fail, they point exactly to the line of code where something went wrong. Since they only execute very little code, they are really fast to execute. That's all nice characteristics. <laughs> so let's start. I, I mentioned earlier that PHP unit is a framework for writing tests and like any other framework, there are a couple of conventions that you should follow to get a lot of convenience functionality for free. The first convention is that the tests for something that is named email go into a class that is named email test. Such an email test class then extends PHP unit framework test case. That is the default base class for your test case classes. Should you have a completely different idea for how you want to write your tests and still want to leverage a lot of, and reuse a lot of functionality and code that PHP unit provides, you can do that. You simply need to implement the very narrow interface PHP unit framework test. As far as I know, at least, nobody has ever done that and I hope that means that PHP unit framework test case is sufficient and convenient for most people at least. The next convention is that a single test goes into a public method 
where the name of the method begins with the prefix test. Some people don't like this method name prefix of test, and they can just omit it and add an annotation with add test in the doc block for that method. If that makes them happy, I am happy, and to each their own. But most people just use uh, the method name with the prefix test. Please do yourself a favor and think for a couple of seconds and come up with a sensible name for the test that precisely and concisely describes what it is that you're testing. In one of the earliest discussions that I had about PHP unit and tests at a customer some 15, 16 years ago, um, the developers were complaining that PHP unit does not give them useful error messages when a test fails. And I said, I cannot understand that because you can just look at the name of the test and then you see what it is that you were trying to test and then you see what went wrong and what is currently broken. And, no, 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 that doesn't work because you look at the output and what they did was they just enumerated the test. They had test one, test two, test three, test 4096 and so on. Of course, if you don't provide the information, PHP unit cannot provide the information when something fails. There is no AI, machine learning, crystal ball, voodoo, magic inside PHP unit that can understand and comprehend the intent of what you're trying to test. You need to encode uh, that information in the name of the test. Naming is one of the hardest problems in programming. A bad name for a class, for a method, for a variable can cost a lot of time and n nerves and effort in the long run. So take your time, take a couple of seconds. If then the name is not clear, talk to someone, ideally to a coworker. If a coworker is not there, talk to your elephant or your rubber duck and there's this thing in, in, uh, in psychology and neurology that basically says, if you have a problem, sometimes the solution comes when you say it out loud because then different areas of your brain are active and it doesn't really matter if you talk to a real human or to a rubber duck or in the case of the PHP community to your stuffed elephant. Um, think about names. Names are important. Naming things is important. So we want to write a test that verifies that we can create an email object from a valid email address. And then inside your test, you can basically do whatever you want. PHP unit does not care what the PHP code looks like that you invoke. You can invoke a global function. You can create an object and call a method. Um, in some really, really, really old PHP two code that I saw a couple of, on, only a couple of years ago that is still in production. It's like a 20 year old version of PHP, why not? Um, they were not even using functions. What was supposed to be a function was in a PHP script and when you wanted to call that function, you included that script and before that you put the parameters into specific global variables and they were read from there and they were deleted and the result came into another global variable. It works and you can test that with PHP unit. Please don't write such code in 2017, but um, PHP unit does not care what you do inside the test method. What PHP unit does care about is you need to tell it how you want to, ver or what you want to verify. What is your condition for the test to be successful? And for that, PHP unit offers you a wide range of so-called assertions. Assertion methods like assert instance of, or assert equals, or assert true, assert false, and so on. Use the most specific one possible that expresses what it is that you want to verify. In this case, we want to verify that we get an email object back. That's why we use assert instance of. In case you were wondering what weird syntax constructs I was using there, like the double colon void at the end of the method signature or 
that declares strict types equals one uh, pragma at the beginning of the PHP source code file. I'm, of course, using PHP 7.1 syntax because that's the current version of PHP and because it's my personal opinion as at least as in when I'm wearing my open source hat at a conference that life is too short for old versions of PHP. I know that's kind of risky or a scary thing for me to say at a Drupal event where you still support PHP 5.5, which is very, very rad because <laughs> PHP 5.5 is dead, dead, dead um, for one and a half years now. And, but okay, that's my opinion. Uh, and new code that I write, I write using PHP 7.1, which is really nice. Um, it's also a lot faster and uses less memory uh, in case you need more arguments. If you want to learn about PHP 7, um, that's the only marketing that I'm going to do. Um, we wrote a book about PHP 7, PHP 7 Explained. There's a discount, 25% discount uh, for DrupalCon attendees. Um, there's one thing that is special about this ebook. Um, it's a one-time purchase and we'll, you'll receive free updates for as long as PHP 7 is current. Even if 10 years from now PHP 7.10 is released, you'll get an update that covers all the changes, all the new features of PHP 7.10. And we are currently working, putting the finishing touches on the coverage of PHP 7.2, which will be released at the end of November, early December, which is shaping up to be yet another really great release, lot, lot, a lot faster than PHP 7.1. Uh, Dimitri and Nikita and Xintian are doing amazing work um, on the compiler and the runtime and the optimizer. Really cool stuff. So, side note and over. So, this is our test. Now we can try to run it. Um, as I mentioned earlier, PHP Unit is a command line tool um, that you point at your tests and it runs your tests. And of course it tells us, hey, I cannot execute this because I cannot find the email class. Probably because we have not written it yet. Um, for each test that PHP unit executes, there's one character of output while the tests are running to indicate progress. In this case, that's an E. That's the um, E that we see up there. The E stands for error. And an error is, um, or an error is reported when a PHP error happens while running the test, like a class has not been found, um, or something unexpected happens, like an exception that was not handled. That's something different uh, compared to an F for failure. An F uh, you will get when an assertion fails. You, as, uh, you expect the return value of that method to be an instance of email and you get back uh, a null, that would be an assertion failure that would be reported with an F for failure instead. Of course, writing that email class um, is really simple. That's what it could look like. Really boring, nothing to see there. So now we get a dot in the output. Dot means successful test and all tests are successful, so we don't get much more output. And that is a philosophy that PHP Unit shares with all the other members of the XUnit family of test frameworks. Um, there's, there's this assumption that all tests should pass all the time. And as long as that is the case, aside from some progress information while the tests are running and some summary at the end, this is the amount of tests that I ran, this is the amount of assertions that were performed, this is how much memory was consumed and this is how long it took. You don't want any more information than that. Only when something goes wrong, when you get an error or a failure for instance, then you get detailed output about that specific test that failed or errored out. Normally, you don't want to see output here for, I don't know, imagine the Drupal test suite with several thousands of tests when you run them, 
you don't want to see a list of the names of all these tests. You're not interested in that. That would be a lot of output, and in that l massive amount of output, the information that you're really interested in would be lost. Maybe 9,999 tests are successful, and you'll see the information for that, and somewhere in the middle there's the one test that is failing, and you don't see that. That's why when everything is fine, no additional output. And that's our feedback loop. We had, we were in the process of writing something that captures an email address. We used a test to describe how we want to interact with that email, how that email could look like. And then we actually implemented that. And that's a really nice feedback loop. It's called test-driven development. Test-driven development means the tests drive the, de uh, uh, the development, not as, um, not just for the sake of writing tests. That's a nice side effect of test-driven development that you get the tests. For me, at least, the most, or one of the, but the most important thing about test-driven development is that it is a tool that helps me think about the problem, helps me understand the problem that I'm currently trying to solve. Can write a, uh, another test, probably, that, that one uses probably, uh, probably the most common uh, assertion method that you use, assert equals, which compares two values. Conventions are, again, are important. Of course, for comparing two values, the order in which you compare them is not important. If you com compare A to B, that's the same as compa comparing B to A. The order, however, is important when the comparison fails and you want to provide a meaningful um, failure message. That's where the convention comes into play. The first argument is the value that you expect and the second value is the actual value that you want to verify and match against the expected value so that PHP unit can tell you, hey, this test has failed, I expected this value, I actually got this, that does not match, that is why the test has failed. Conventions. Oh, yeah, there's the output example, there's the F for failure, there was one failure, I expected a string and I got an email object that doesn't match. That is why the test has failed. Yeah, then, we can, then we can implement the missing functionality. In this case, we were missing the toString method that allows us to use the object as a string in a string context. And then um, it just works. What happens when something goes wrong? How can we test that in an error case of in the, that happens inside the code that we're testing? How can we verify that we get an exception when that happens? That's um, how you test exceptions. And Right before this presentation, I had uh, a discussion with one of you from the audience about exactly this, and the question was, the documentation shows at least two different ways of testing exceptions. Which is the one that I should use, or which is the one that, uh, that we should use? And as of right now, that's the best practice or the good practice that I would recommend of using. For a really long time, until some point last year or yeah, one and a half years ago, I recommended using the expected exception annotation, which at first glance is a lot more convenient. You put it in an annotation, in a doc block, in front of the test method. It's not in, in the test code. Um, some people prefer that, some people f uh, find that easier on the eye, easier to read. 
There's one problem with that. Uh, there's at least one problem with that, though. If I put it at the in, uh, on the annotation, then the test would be successful if at any point in the execution of the test method that exception is raised. This allows me to tell PHP unit only after this point in time while running the test, when I have this method call, only now is it okay that this exception comes and that marks the test as successful. If that exception is raised before that expect exception call, then it is an error. And there were a lot of situations where using the annotation hides problems in the code. And that's one of the worst things that you can have when you're testing, that you have a test that you went through the effort of writing the test, maybe even went through the effort of making the, te the, the code testable that you're testing, and then have a test that lies to you because you get the exception way earlier and not in the place where you're expecting it, and then it's hidden from you and the test tells you it's green, it's fine, everything is good, continue, and it's not. You don't want lying tests. Yeah, that's what it looks like when it goes wrong. <laughs> we are missing more, um, more code. We need to actually have code in our email value object that verifies that this string that we pass is a valid email. And then our third test also works correctly. So those were three examples for writing tests. Compare two variables for, for equality using assert equals, asserting that a variable contains an object of a certain type, and ensuring that we get an exception, uh, exception when uh, we want the code to raise an exception. And basically, I have shown you now all that you need to know to write tests for 70 to 80% of the cases. PHP unit has a lot of functionality. Um, just look at the documentation. There are so many features. There are dozens of assertions, dozens of configuration settings and sometimes weird and bizarre modes of running the tests. A lot of those things, a lot of those features were added over the course of the project because to support testing, I don't really want to say crappy code, but code that was not written with testability in mind. In a perfect world, which unfortunately we don't live in, in a perfect world I could delete like 80% of the code and everything would be fine. But it's this 10, 20% that you need to know to get started. And once you have mastered that, then it's really easy to look, okay, now I'm in this situation, now I need a, a very specific assertion look in the documentation, oh, I find something, I need to assert that an array is empty and there is assert empty, um, and that's okay. Maybe you are testing a piece of code that has a lot of interaction with global state. It manipulates a lot of global variables. There's a feature that you can turn on that makes a backup of all global and super global variables before each test and place that back after each test. Don't turn that on if you don't need it. If you write clean, modern, object-oriented code, you don't need global variables. So you, can turn, you don't need to turn that on. It's an expensive operation that takes time and consumes memory. Don't do that. But you can turn it on for the, on a test-by-test -test basis for those tests where you need to interact with global variables, maybe because you're testing a piece of code 
that is 10, 15 years old and that still uses global variables, and that's okay. But to get the general idea of how to write and execute tests, you don't need to care about that. You only need to know that's, that's possible when you need it. So all the tests that I've shown so far are unit tests. And all of these automated dynamic tests, what they do is verification through execution. I execute a piece of code and I verify that it does what it is supposed to be doing or at least what I have understood what it should be doing. Just because a unit test passes does not necessarily mean that the feature that uses the unit of code that we're, t that we're using there, that we're testing with the unit test, does what the, the user, what the customer actually wanted. That's a different type of test. It's that, that would be an acceptance test, for instance. You can write code that is really nice and clean and modern and has good unit test coverage, but it still does not do what it is what it's supposed to be doing. Verification through execution means I have a piece of code, I invoke it, I look at the result and make a decision, yes, this is what I want, this is not what I want. There's a very special case um, with regard to verification through execution. And that's a category of tests called characterization tests. Those tests don't make a statement about whether or not a software system or a part of a software system works correctly. It just captures how it works today. Can give you an example from, from a recent customer they had a really large method, four or 5,000 lines of code. By looking at it, it was not really clear what it was doing, why it was doing it. It was doing a lot. You looked at it and, and you could see, okay, it was doing four, five, six different things. Uh, most of which were really important for at least one of those blocks the developers were not really sure whether that was really needed or whether that related to a feature that they removed from the application three years ago and it was just a leftover. We were not, since we did not know what it was supposed to be doing, it had a couple of arguments and we did not know with which arguments to call it and what the return value should be. Um, so we couldn't figure out arguments to call it with and then an expected result. And in a situation like that, when you're writing tests for legacy code, that's okay. That's where characterization tests can help. So we looked at a couple of requests to the actual site and figured out and, and got the information from, from function traces with which parameters it actually gets called right now in production and for these sets of input, what is, the, what is the result? And then we wrote some code, a test, an integration test that used that information. And while we were doing that, we realized, hey, it might be even a better idea to just duplicate that method in the same class, make a copy of that method, and in our test, call it twice call the, the original one and call the copy. And then we made changes to that method. We started refactoring it. We sliced it down into five, six smaller methods. And we used that test ca calling the old version and the new version and just compared the results from those two. And as long as they were the same, we were comfortable enough that we were not breaking anything. That's the characterization test very special case of verification through execution. You can 
have a different perspective on verification through execution when you look at a test not only from the perspective of I want to ensure that this thing works correctly I'm, and leave the view of, of testing and look at it um, from a different angle. And then you can look at the test code that you wrote, at the unit test that you wrote, from the perspective of it being executable documentation. A unit test is an example for how the unit that it tests can be used. Imagine you are a new developer coming on the team that, you, that has somewhere in its code base this email object I had earlier. And for the first time, you need to work with that email object. Sure, thanks to naming, you know what email does, but you don't know the implementation details of that. And the promise of object-oriented programming is that you don't even need to know the implementation details. You only need to know the public API. But still, you need to know how to use that. So what do you do? You look at the unit tests for that email class and you see actually working examples for how this code can be used. Moreover, you see when I call it like this, then this is the result that I get. That's perfect, that's really good. If you shift your view on that test code slightly, then you go from executable documentation to executable specification, especially in the context of test-driven development. The tests are a tool to structure your thoughts and understand the problem, and then you use the tests to specify how the thing that you are about to write should behave. PHP unit support supports this idea through an alternative output that's called test docs. And you can get that, for instance, using PHP unit dash dash test docs. Then it just uses this alternative output and prints that to the command line. You can also get that as an almost nice looking, at least it's not ugly looking, uh, HTML. Um, some teams have really great, have really made a great success and experience with using that HTML, not to print it out. Please don't hurt the trees. But um, they use that in continuous integration. And in addition to the normal output that is useful for the developers, they generate this HTML and put it um, somewhere on the internet, in, on a wiki, for instance. And the domain experts, the business analysts, the non technical stakeholders, look at this document and they understand that. They see, okay, that the developer is talking about a concept that is called email and that can be created from a valid email address and, and so on. And that's something that I, even as a non-technical person, can understand. And of course, for something rather technical like email, that's rather boring. It gets really interesting if you have things like contracts or, or other things from your business domain represented as objects in your code plus the executable documentation and specification through the tests and then you can take this, show that to someone, here, this is how I understood that this piece of our business should work and this is how it currently works because this is automatically verified through tests did I understand that correctly or not? And this output, believe it or not, is a really good communication tool between technical and non-technical stakeholders of a project. This summarizes what I mentioned uh, once or twice already, at least for me. Test-driven development and the writing of tests, unit tests especially, is not just about verifying that something works correctly. It is a tool that helps me think about the problem that I'm solving. And as a developer, my primary job is not the production of code. My job is to understand and solve a problem. And yes, sure, as part of that, I need to write code. 
but the code is not really that what the user wants. The user wants a solution. Um, decades ago, Bill Gates already said something similar um, when he said, well, the idea of paying software developers by the amount of code they produce is as silly as paying an engineer that, create, that builds an aircraft by the amount, by, uh, by the weight of the airplane. That's stupid. You want to solve a problem and you want a good solution. Um, and I can only give you my subjective personal experience. I cannot work without unit tests and in most situations I cannot work without <coughs> test-driven development anymore. I have still to figure out how to apply test-driven development to the development of a test framework. Maybe at some point I figure that out, but when it comes to PHP unit, I always write the tests after I implemented the, the feature test-driven development. At least in most cases for the test framework itself doesn't work for me, but that's a, a rather special problem that only people have that work on testing tools, so that should not concern you. Um, that's, that's my headache, not, not yours. Um, but tests for me are a tool to, to structure my thought process while I'm trying to solve a problem. And that works for me rather well. Yeah, and of course that somehow relates um, to what Uncle Bob talks about, or what Uncle Bob means when he talks about clean code. Um, and to me, still, the best definition of what clean code is, what, what, what we should strive for as programmers, is uh, what Dave Thomas wrote in the introduction uh, to the clean code book. Clean code can be read and enhanced by, by a developer other than the original author. I would even go further. Clean code is code that I, can, that, that I have written today and can understand a year from now. It does not have to be another person. It can be future you. Write code that future you and your teammates today can understand. Happened to me so often over this, I don't know, 16, 17 years that I've been working on PHP unit that I needed to work on one area and I look at the code, I said, what was I thinking when I wrote this? I don't understand it. And I look at the history, oh, I wrote that 12 years ago. Yeah, it turns out I learned something in the last five years and I wouldn't write the code like that anymore. But now I have to deal with it and maybe rewrite it or improve it at least a little bit to make the pain go away. Um, yeah, can be read and enhanced by a developer other than its original author. It has unit and acceptance tests. Meaningful names. Yes, naming things is hard, but it's so worth it to have names. Um, that really reflects the domain uh, in which your problem is. Yeah, one way of doing things uh, and not multiple ways. Minimal dependencies, which are explicit, meaning dependency injection. Make ex dependencies explicit, don't hide dependencies and make them exchangeable, loose coupled code, and minimal, yeah. Yeah, and put in yet another way, uh, yet into another uh, phrasing, what Steve Freeman and Ned Price wrote in Growing Object Oriented Software Guided by Tests, the Goose book. For a class to be easy to unit test, the class must have explicit dependencies that can be substituted and clear responsibilities that can easily be invoked and verified. In other terms, the code must be loosely coupled and, cohes and highly cohesive, or in yet another phrasing, well-designed. And test-driven <coughs> development helps you get there. I talked a lot about unit tests. But there are other tests, other kinds of software tests, other kinds of tests that you can implement using a tool such as PHP Unit, for instance. And with all these tests, there are a couple of questions that you can use to categorize these tests. 
what do I want to achieve with the test? What is it that I want to test? Do I want to verify that my software handles an email address or a credit card number or an IBAN or an address correctly at a very low level? Yes, I want to verify that these things work isolated from everything else. I do not want to test these things in the largest possible co uh, scope. I do not want to have thousands of different tests that test with different combinations of credit cards and credit card information and address information using the real payment service provider, whether or not that works or not. That's not what you want to do. That's what you want to do on the, in the smallest possible scope because you need a lot of variance in there, many different types of tests, a lot of test data to exercise these really important pieces of code. And if you do that with a unit test, these tests are really, really fast. And you don't need to talk to other systems, and they're much more robust, uh, robust, and they give you precise information. Sure, you will need a couple of tests that test, that exercise your entire payment process, including talking to payment service providers. But you only need very few of those. You need, basically just need to check, does it work for one address with one credit card? And if it works for that, then you can assume that it works for the rest. Because all the variants you have tested on a much smaller scope. How much code do we need to execute to verify the thing that we want to verify? That's probably the most important question when it comes to testing. You always want to execute as few lines of code as possible. The more code you execute, the longer the test takes. The more te uh, code you execute, the more places you need to look for the cause when something fails. If you only execute five lines of code as part of a unit test and the test fails, then the reason for that test failing can only be in one of those five lines. How do we write down the test? How do we formulate the test impulse, which basically means how do I write down how I build my environment? How do I invoke the piece of software that I want to test and how do I write down the expectation for this uh, test uh, to be successful. There are many different ways. I've shown you how to write down tests with PHP unit. There are other tools that allow you, for instance, to use natural languages, uh, things like Cucumber and Behat, which are well suited for large scope um, acceptance uh, tests. When do we write a test? Do I write a test after the fact? Do I do test-driven development and write a test before? Um, when do I execute the test? A lot of tests make a lot of sense to execute in production. Things like A-B tests, multivariate tests to test a, 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 a hypothesis about a new feature. Does it make sense to implement that feature? Do I get better conversion if I make the button purple or blue? Things like that you have to do and you have to test in production. What you don't want to test in production is whether or not uh, your credit card validation works correctly. That would be rather stupid. Um, and if you Google or use your favorite search engine to um, ask this thing called the internet for different categories of software tests, you mo most likely you will find one of many different pyramids. Uh, last time I checked, there were like 15 different visualizations for software categories that use the pyramid. I'm going to show you one pyramid um, that's rather representative of, of, uh, of the others. At the bottom, you have unit tests, pure unit tests, small tests, whatever you want to call them, that only execute code from one unit of code in isolation from all of the dependencies including not touching the file system, not, not, not talking to the database, not talking to the network. In some rare cases, the object does not talk to other objects because it has no other dependencies. It's rare, but it happens. Most likely, you have something on that level where you need to, do, where you need to use techniques such as stubs and mocks 
to decouple the unit of code that you're testing from its dependencies. One level up, you have integration tests. Just because you test object A in isolation from its dependency B, and B in isolation from A does not necessarily mean that A and B work correctly together. That's what you do with integration tests. Then you, one level up, you do edge-to-edge uh, -edge tests, which is as end-to-end -end as possible without using an, a real HTTP client and a real HTTP server. This is what you would do with a Symfony application, for instance, where you instantiate the application inside the same PHP process that runs uh, the PHP unit tests. Say you, you have a PHP unit test, an integration test, and you instantiate a Drupal and prepare a request and give that request to Drupal and Drupal does its thing and gives you a response and you look into that response, that would be an edge to edge test. It's a lot faster than using a real browser instrumenting that, sending a real HTTP request to the server and looking at the response. Of course, sometimes you need to do that, especially if you have uh, JavaScript in your front end and you need to test JavaScript interaction. Then. Yeah, I, I'm to already talking faster. My, my clock says one minute. Okay. This is the last slide, I think. Um, so, of course, if you have JavaScript and you need to do uh, something with JavaScript, something like Selenium that instruments a Firefox or Chrome, there's nothing you can do about that. But the pyramid doesn't stop there. Um, you can go even further up, but then you cannot automate it anymore. Higher up would mean maybe you're in e-commerce and you want to test your log uh, logistics tool chain and your warehouse. What you can automate is go to the website, search for a product, go to the product detail page, put it into the shopping cart, make a checkout, including a real payment, and then have people in the warehouse look at the people who work in the warehouse. Uh, do they take the shortest route to the shelf? Do they take the right kind of package? Uh, how long does that take? <coughs> and how long does it take for the, um, the delivery service uh, to ring at your doorbell and deliver the package. And yes, people are doing that. But no, they're not doing that in continuous integration. They do that once a year. Um, so, almost on time, sorry. Uh, thank you, I hope this was, gave, gave you um, an, an overview of what this PHP unit thing is about. Hopefully, in case you were scared of writing tests and using PHP unit before, hopefully you're not scared anymore. Hopefully you're interested in trying this out. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is I'm here at DrupalCon um, tomorrow at the Code Sprint, and apparently I'm helping people um, who work on tests for, for Drupal core. But if you have a question about PHP unit, uh, be it related to Drupal or not, feel free to grab me, ask your question, and I'm looking forward to discuss all things PHP and PHP unit with you tomorrow and help you make Drupal better. Thank you.